and you are good for launch. And just to let you know, the phone lines are open and working because I'm on my phone right now. So you're good to go. So you're good to go. Okay, great, Matt. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, we, the board was just an executive session prior to this where we were reviewing, uh, going over contract negotiations. Um, so at 7.04, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Julie, would you do roll call, please? Sure. Barbara Dayton? Here. Dave Conlin? Here. Tim Frazier? Here. Amy Rivera? Pat Brabant? Here. Thank you. And if we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the, to flag, the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to and the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Thank you very much. I certainly look forward to being able to go back and do that in person. Um, we, let's see, our first item on the agenda this evening is a Greater East Hampton Foundation grant. Deb, do you want to tell us about that? Oh, I'd love to. This is a, a Laura Dunn put in for what's called a story walk. I don't know if you've ever seen them. I know there's one at Mystic Seaport. You take a large book, one of those really large books, and you put them on uh, boards and you place them around a park or like an aquarium um, and the children walk and read the story. So she got $1,400 for her grant to, to uh, create story walks. I believe she's gonna do it right across by uh, Pussy's Pond and wherever else um, in the community. And um, it was a great idea and the administration supported it and the Greater East uh, Hampton Education Foundation thought it was a great idea. So congratulations to Laura Dunham. Oh, definitely. Congratulations, Laura. That sounds really exciting. I look forward to seeing it. Uh, I'm curious, do, what kind of materials will that be that will be um, outdoors? Is it? Uh, I guess it has to be laminated, like, you know, a poster. Um, if, if you Google um, story walks, you'll see some of them, Barbara. Okay, I will definitely do that. Um, thanks, and that, that's great. It's wonderful how many teachers we have who take advantage of these uh, grant options that are out there and all the interesting things that we do. That they, that they do with them, I should say. Um, moving on from recognition, we're going to have a capital project update. We have um, Derek and Jim and John here with us this evening. Welcome, everybody. Uh, look forward to seeing what's what's new and what's going on. I'm trying to share my screen, but it says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Hey, Bob, I'm sorry. Should we accept the minutes from last month's meeting first? Uh, then we're doing that later in the meeting. It doesn't okay. have to be done at the beginning. Okay, cool. Julie, is there something you can help Derek out with? <laughs> and then I'm assuming, John, you'll have a presentation also too, right? Yeah, that's correct. We'll need the same uh, permissions granted to uh, to myself. So I'll need to share a screen as well on the after Derek has concluded. Okay. And, and Jim, I'll I'll uh, navigate the presentation for your part, Jim, so you don't have to share your screen again. Are you able to do it, John? No, I'm not able to do it right now. It says uh, it. Something that Matt needs to do, or is Julie uh, able to? I'm asking Julie. We're on Uh, school board, just to let you know, 
My uh, share screen option is allowing people to come in. So how do they share a screen, Matt? Um, Something Mr. Nats, ha haven't you done this before, Mr. Nats? Yes, I have. And what, there's and a button to share screen. Right. And you, But it says host disabled participants screen sharing. Uh, really? In the past, that never came up before. I was able to share my screen. Seems like... It's saying, that, it's saying that for me also. So it's on Matt's side. It would either be that, Deb, or the let's, originator. Let's retry it. Let's retry it. Let's retry it. It would be John, whoever initiated the invite. Yeah, looks like it's working. There we go. Thank you, Matt. Always here to help. Okay. Can you see my screen? Almost. There you go. Got it. All right, wonderful. Well, yes, thank you I for can, having yeah. us tonight. Uh, this is the January 2021 uh, bond update. So tonight's presentation is going to consist of the following topics. Work progress for December 2020, January 2021. Planned work for February 2021. And then we'll show you a series of photos associated with that update. So starting with work scheduled for January 2021, they're continuing with masonry for the gym. The block work is pretty much 100% complete. So they're doing some of the uh, brick facade, some interior chases. They're also building chases to conceal the roof drain piping on the interior of the building. They're about 10% complete with that scope. They continued installing brick veneer around the entire addition. Uh, they're about 50% complete with that scope. Completing roofing and fascias for the new addition. So the pitch roofs are completed at this time. The flat roofs are about 35% complete. Installing HVAC ductwork for the new classrooms. About 30% of that ductwork is hung. Uh, insulation is waiting for the building to be weather tight. So we would project the insulation for the ductwork and piping to be done end of February, beginning of March. Installing supply and return piping for the new heating units. They're about 65% complete with that item. Installing sidewalk, sidewalks and curbs for the parking lots, about 25% complete with that item. Installing sod for the new athletic fields, 90% uh, complete with the sod installation for the fields. Projected work scheduled for February 2021, uh, com completing the new wall CMU for the new addition. Overall, they're about 90% complete. Uh, we project that they're going to be completing all the block work uh, by the end of February. Also finishing the installation of the brick on the new addition. As I previously stated, about 50% is complete to date. Weather pending, it's projected that it would be complete by the end of February as well. Finished rough plumbing and heating. Uh, they were 65% complete. Again, this is another scope that we see finishing up uh, on the month of February. Installing HVAC ERV rooftop units. With the exception of the gym, all the HVAC curbs have been installed. By the end of February, all curbs will be installed allowing for temporary heat for the month of March. Sheetrocking trusses at the, at the roof areas and installing roofing on the gym addition. Uh, the roofing hasn't, it started elsewhere in the building, just it hasn't started on the gym yet. Uh, again, we project that this scope will be completed by the end of February. Here's some photos. This is the interior of the gym addition. Uh, the CMU is completed. Uh, they plan to pour the gym slab uh, this week, as long as weather allows. And uh, as stated before, the roofing will be done by the end of February for the gym. 
Here's some exterior elevation photos. This is the boys and girls locker room. Uh, new roof, roofing and trusses and brick veneer. You can see the asphalt shingles, the hardy plank fascia board. Uh, windows and doors are ordered and expected to be delivered and installed the month of March. Here's some of the flat roofing areas. Uh, the white material, the bottom layer is a moisture uh, barrier. Then on top of that's tapered, tapered insulation that helps uh, the flow of water for, uh, pushing it to the roof drains. And then ultimately it gets covered with the TPO roof. Some interior shots. Uh, doesn't really contrast well with the metal decking, but you could see uh, there's ductwork uh, that's going to supply the ventilation and the heating for the new spaces. Some additional ceiling shots uh, showing the installation of piping for the heat system. There's also domestic water in these photos, as well as the black pipe that's the uh, roof drain piping. All the roof drain piping has been piped into the dry well. So once the roof is on, all the water is going to its final destination within the ground. Here's some uh, finished sidewalks and curb for the new car uh, loop. This location is the east elevation off the new addition. All the drainage has been installed. Since this photo has been taken, the RCA has been uh, installed and rolled out. Asphalt is on hold until weather is more conducive and that we have less uh, construction traffic not to damage the new asphalt. Some additional curbs and sidewalks for the new field parking. And this is also the access, new access road in. Again, all the drainage has been installed. RCA has been started. Asphalt's being held off uh, until weather allows. The next step in this area is the light pole bases, and that will be followed by the remaining 10% of the sod that's left to be installed. Here's two photos of the sod. Uh, irrigation's 100% uh, installed, tested, blown out uh, for the winter, but it's ready to go once weather allows. Uh, again, they're about 90% complete with the side installation. And once the site lighting is completed, uh, that will allow for Lantec to complete this sod 100%. All right, here's the exterior elevations. If you uh, see the corner brick areas, uh, you can see the roofing again, and you can see the hardy plank fascias. Um, this area will get a stucco finish uh, to match the existing look of the existing building. So you'll have those brick corners and then there'll be some stucco and it actually will look like the rendering on this final slide. Uh, as you can see, you can see the brick corners, the stucco and that, that will all be accomplished, we would say by the end of March, beginning of April. That concludes the construction update. Any questions or comments? Okay. Nice job. Oh, Thank you so much. No questions, Derek. I mean, it just, it looks amazing. It's so exciting how this is coming along. Especially as, as how wet it's been over yeah. the last month. And um, hopefully the, this week and next week, we won't get as much rain. Yeah, the, the rain has been a difficult aspect. Fortunately, the weather hasn't been very cold. So right. they're able to, and the guys have been doing a great job to, you know, find work that's available to them when the weather is not necessarily the best. So. We, we feel we're on schedule. Uh, some items are a little behind, but other items are way ahead. So when you look at it as an overall project, uh, we seem to be in good shape uh, for, for where we are in the, in the month of January. Thanks, Howard.
All right. Well, thank you. And turn it over to John Longo. Thanks very much, Derek. You're welcome. A happy dog. <laughs> Those aren't my dogs. <laughs> They're mine. <laughs> Derek, can you stop sharing your screen, please? <laughs> That's a lot, John. <laughs> there you go. Hey, you may notice the template for my presentation looks familiar. <laughs> Okay, hopefully uh, mine also. Is everybody seeing uh, something that looks similar, but now it says Wait, kindergarten? Wait, we just saw this. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, uh, Derek uh, called me out for using his template. <laughs> Get copyright uh, permission? Well, uh, if I had more than th three seconds to do any one task in a day, I, it would have looked different, so... <laughs> We're happy Barbara, I think you're in the red shirt there on the front, aren't you? <laughs> We're protecting the names of the innocent there. Okay, so uh, thanks uh, for having us back. I know uh, you guys have seen Jim uh, recently, so you haven't seen me since before the break in October is when we last talked about the playground. So happy new year, glad to be back. After the October presentation, we did have a few uh, slight revisions to the playground and I will show those to you. But uh, as it stands, uh, now we believe we have a final design and a final budget and I'll, I'll bring us through uh, where we are. As part of this presentation also, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Wadig is going to discuss the, uh, the roof reconstruction on the balance of the, uh, the middle school area uh, after my conclusion of the playground. So um, this is just a shot of the existing playground equipment that's out there, the pea gravel surface. Um, so all the equipment will be removed. All that pea gravel will be removed. We're gonna reuse the pea gravel in uh, drainage areas that I'm gonna be designing into the project. So we can uh, you know, be uh, eco-friendly here and reuse the products that we have and that'll help reduce some costs. That's great drainage stone, it's 3 HP gravel. Really can't find anything better to put in the ground to uh, assist with drainage. Uh, this blue area represents the footprint that we're working with. Um, for budget purposes, and when we when we costed out the project uh, in the pre-referendum uh, arena, we utilized the existing footprint of the playground, and that's what we're going to still use for uh, our boundary, so to speak. It's a very large area, and even if you go out there today, there's lots of open space, and we're, and we're still going to have that, which I think is good because the kids do like to run from one piece of equipment to the other and, uh, and have different opportunities. This next slide is just uh, it's a perspective view on the bottom of all the equipment in total. And then on top is an elevation as if you were standing at ground level looking across the playground. So you'll see we have two different uh, areas of uh, play units uh, targeted for kindergarten, first grade, eh, up to second grade, if you will. And then we have, uh, we have eight swings that we're gonna be putting in all uh, with handicapped accessible uh, swing also. Um, different climbing and jumping things. In the, in, the, in the middle there, you'll see a little clubhouse. And that's the one thing that changed from last time. We wanted uh, some of the comments back from staff were uh, some kids made like a, uh, a secure space, a place away from the action, just some a place to be in a, in a quiet environment, so to speak. So what we did was we did, it's an upper and lower uh, sort of clubhouse, but it also has some fun things built into it, like slides and things. And I'll, I'll show you those when we get into a bigger picture here. So on the bigger picture here, you can now, I zoomed in, so the, the surfacing that's gonna be on this playground is the engineered wood fiber system. Um, it's different than what's gonna be on the playground uh, over by the new gymnasium. That's the rubberized surface. It's a, very, it's a you know, different targeted age group over there. So this one we can go with uh, some of the, you know, the, it's a smaller space also. Uh, it's a considerable cost difference to utilize the rubber. So the actual, the wood, uh, the plastic timber border that you actually have out there is actually designed as part of the five bar system. So that's already in place, which is good. So what we'll do is I'm gonna take a section of that out, because right now you have to step up into it and over it. So I'm gonna take a section of that out and make it handicapped accessible, meaning you could roll in if you had to. Um, so we meet the code that way. 
So here you'll see the different elements. Uh, in the foreground is a triple slide, some deck uh, mounted things. We got some nice slides. The color scheme mimics the color scheme that we've approved for the, uh, the other playground. So everything will be cohesive from this playground on this side of the building to the other side of the building. Um, at the bottom of the picture where it says school side, obviously that would, that's, that's about the area where the, uh, the doors are with the, where the children would be coming out of the kindergarten area. So this is the view on the fence side back there where the grass is. We're gonna have a new uh, fence that's gonna contain the playground. So the property line side where your neighbor's driveway is, as well as the parking lot side. Because right now it's that open chain link fence and the cars park head in there. So we're gonna be screening the playground from uh, those two sides on the other side, it's uh, vegetated. And we're gonna replace that fence also. And then on the school side, there will be no fence. Uh, here's uh, another view. This would be looking back towards the kindergarten at the top of the screen, uh, towards the, uh, the buildings. The swings are, are gonna be uh, in the general area where they are now. So we're gonna utilize that space. It's a big open space for, for the swings. Um, and then you'll see the different uh, ground mounted elements. The one at the bottom is called the Wee Saw. That's the new technology of Seesaw. It's really pretty, it's, it's pretty cool because you can get kids in the middle there and you can get four kids rocking back and forth and it's, it gets pretty, pretty hairy. But you know, the kids love this type of stuff. And a lot of the, you know, the newer technology um, and, and trend is uh, cable climbing and things like that. So the upper, reinforcing the upper body as well as the, phone, the fine motor skills with the deck and ground level equ uh, equipment, things that they can turn and, and play with. We also want them to start to develop muscles as well. So that's why we have these climbing type of apparatus. <coughs> and that's the playground. Uh, <coughs> looks similar to the last time I showed it, but we had a couple of, you know, we added some more of these toadstool climbing things down here. Um, and with that, we then, since we, we feel like we're at a good place where we could put a cost <laughs> We did a we did a rough cost estimate for the uh, playground itself. We have the equipment purchase and installation, which will be by the same playground vendor and company who we are procuring. I think we cut the PO already, also to American Recreational. So we make we're going to ensure that we have the same uh, company equipment and also the same installer, so that when if if and you know there's any maintenance items that are needed down the road or warranty items, it's a one-stop shop for a phone call. Um, so what we have estimated right now is the playground and the surfacing and some new sidewalks and things of that nature in total as a construction cost, not a project cost, as we know, project costs are different because they include uh, architectural fees, the soft costs and things of that nature, but the construction cost of this is estimated at right around 300,000. And the fence work is around 22,000. So project cost of 323000 um, So before I, and what we had anticipated, remember these are, this is a B-list project. I think uh, that may have come up at the last meeting or the meeting before, so that it is included in the bond when funding is available. Um, and this budget is actually in line with the projection of the B-list in the pre-ref we had anticipated uh, around 370000 or so as a project cost. So when we start extrapolating the fees and the soft costs, we arrive at, at roughly the same number in terms of the raw construction uh, value. So before we start talking about roof, I'm going to pause and answer any of the playground questions, okay? So if there's any questions about the playground or the cost, John, what do you need from us to go forward with this? We're, we're going to, um, I just basically need a, you know, a, just the verbal approval that everybody's satisfied with the design. And we will send, we will probably, we will not probably, we're going to, we're going to send this up to the state. I'll work with Jim uh, Leidig in our office and we'll, we'll permit this. Um, what's nice is we have time. They're not going to do the installation or the demolition until school ends at the end of June. So we're, we're right in that perfect window of uh, securing uh, um, approvals. And I will have to, because we're gonna be buying the playground equipment and the install from the PO, 
I will have to do a little mini bid for the balance of the site work. Because right now we don't have a vendor for that. Um, so rather than uh, utilizing any of the existing contractors with change orders and things, because it's going to be a sum that exceeds what SCD likes to see, you know, for, for ease of uh, continuity, keeping, you know, all the work with the contractors that are there makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. But, you know, when the state, you know, provides uh, building aid assistance, they like to see that due diligence is done. So then that we receive multiple quotes for the work. It doesn't mean that the contractor who's there won't win the bid. It just means that we'll open up the bidding process for this particular project. But we will be able to procure because the playground equipment was a pre-bid contract, as, as you guys know, you know, with the other stuff when we issued the PO. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thanks very much, John. Um, appreciate You're welcome. That. Really great. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm excited. You know, this is the you know this is really going to be the uh, the finishing touch, I think, for for campus. You know, I like to call it a campus because you know it's a one building school, but it really you know serves many functions there. And uh, and having the, the little guys get a get a fresh playground, and it's time. You know, the equipment is uh, the equipment's you know showing its age. Um, the surfacing really isn't the best there. So it's time to uh, polish it up. And I think it's going to be great. You know, when we uh, give you guys the keys to the car in, uh, in the fall, it's going to be unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Our insurance company is going to love us, John. <laughs> well, it'll be, you know, it'll be like three less phone calls you have to, you know, take every year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to move on to Jim uh, with the, the exciting world of roofs. So <laughs> stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, um, good evening, everybody. The I don't know if we discussed this as a in what venue we discussed it, but I know it kind of came about as a hot item within the last uh, month or two uh, about these roofs over the middle school classrooms. Um, so, this highlighted area that's shown here is the area where there's roof leaks that are persistent and problematic in this area of the building. As you can see, it's situated over two areas that were built at different times, but uh, at some point in time, I guess in 2001, they re roofed everything because it's all one similar material. Um, so, in looking at that, it's approximately 22,000 square feet of, of roof area. And uh, given the age and type of roof that it is, it's an EPDM roof system. Uh, it's a rubber sheet basically that gets you know adhered to the substrate materials and has seams, you know, it comes in like eight foot rolls or whatever, and they gotta seam these uh, sheets together so that they stay watertight. And the roof has about a 20 year warranty typically um, for these EPDM roofs. So as you could as we know, we're in 2021 and that's 20 years to the day. And it seems like this roof has done its job for the time that it's been over the roof. So um, warranty is expired and now it's time to replace uh, that roof in, in total. So when we look at that area, we'll be designing um, you know, a new roof system that'll incorporate um, the TPO roof technology that's being used on the new building additions. And it's a thermoplastic polyolefin. And again, it's a sheet product, but it's more durable than the EPDM. It won't break down as easy. The seams are more welded than they are glued. So it tends to hold up better over the 20 year lifespan or the 20 year warranty span of the roof. Um, and when we do a, a roof job, we don't just go over what was there. We rip we have the contractors rip the entire roof plus any substrate material down to the existing deck surface so that we can fully assess what's down you know the, the structural um, substrate that's over the classrooms to see if there's any deterioration or rotting or or things that need to be addressed before we start putting a new roof system on um, and in 20 years the um the requirements for insulation and, and uh, keeping buildings warm and not using too much heat and uh, mechanical systems to stay warm is that they've increased the thickness requirements for insulation on the roof. So um, 
what may have been three or four inches maximum insulation in uh, 2001 is now like eight inches of of insulation uh, in some areas by the time you taper the roofs to a drain and get everything to flow as Derek was mentioning with the roof drains uh, this is kind of the real crux of the matter in getting that um, system complete and uh, covered in the warranty so that whole area will be thoroughly removed and, and the new roof system will be put down um, in doing so, we also replace the roof drains and the, the roof drain bodies. The piping that goes to the stormwater systems remains, but we want to make sure that anything that's tied into that roof system is covered under their warranty. Um, so that will also include any gutters that are out there. There's like one or two areas that have like fascia mounted gutters, not a lot, but there are a few. And then uh, fascia replacement itself, and that's like the white or silver band that you'll see going around a building or in many cases out here, that, that forest green color. Um, so it really is a full system that gets replaced and it's the full system that gets a warranty. And nowadays with the way things have been going with roofing uh, manufacturers, they wanna have assurance that the products that get installed don't affect the performance of that roof. So they're really very specific as to what can be used in the full system uh, installation and they go so far as to provide a letter that says you know this is the roof area that we're covering this is the fascias that are being used and 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 everything is if all these things are used you'll be covered for your 20 years so it's important that we follow those guidelines and make sure that's all adhered to uh, and looking at this roof with current costs the way things are going uh Looking at it being roughly one million eighty one hundred thousand five hundred sixty eight dollars. Um, the last estimate we had done when we were looking at this roof was back it was about a year ago, and it was uh, eight hundred ninety thousand dollars back then. So we've gone back to the manufacturers, asked for their current pricing on the roof systems, um, gone back and look at contractors' increases over the past year with. COVID and everything else they've been kind of encountering that they have to account for in their general conditions. So roughly 1.2% increase in the cost um, over that year. So, um, you know, it's a large enough roof area. Um, so, it, you know, this is kind of what we're up against as far as the costs go. Um, we're in the process of getting the, built, you know, the roof designed and doing our due diligence with roof cores to assess the condition of the deck. We don't expect there to be any asbestos since this roof was done in you know, 2000, so there really shouldn't be any remnants of anything. Um, but we do the cores just to be you know, certain that there's nothing that slipped through the cracks and somebody was using some old materials on flashing and opened up a can that contained asbestos, you never know. Um, so we're working towards plans being available to go out to bid you know, probably in February or March. This project will not be going to SED because it is an emergency that needs to be, this project needs to start this summer um, and finish by August. So the determination was uh, by not going to the state that um, there'd be no state aid on this, you know, given for this roof. Uh, but the urgency to getting it done uh, I guess outweigh the need of the of the aid, and uh, the the time frames that we're looking at in terms of review, are, you know, kind of increasing. So I think this is definitely the way to go. It'll allow us to lock in a a good roofing contractor early in the bidding season, and get them to start making submittals during the uh, you know February, March, April, uh, so that we can hit the ground running in June, and and these guys come the end of school, can start ripping and material will be arriving on site and they can start installing. Uh, I don't see any problems with this happening in the course of two months uh, for construction. So there shouldn't be any issues come August or I should say September and, and having it all complete. There may be a few little you know, uh, issues getting um, fascias and stuff, but that the roof system, everything will be watertight and there may be some little cleanup work that may be having to take place in September, but nothing that's going to interrupt school, nothing's going to um, sacrifice the utilization of the spaces or anything like that. Um, so we're 
moving ahead on this. Um, we'll be out there in the next few weeks meeting with the contractors that are doing the cores and doing some field verification to make sure, you know, we got the, um, the right placement of roof trains, mechanical equipment that's up on the roof. We identify to make sure our tapered insulation plans accounts for flowing water around those curbs. Uh, those pieces of equipment had to be removed so that we could put new curbs down because of the thicker insulation. So there's a lot of work involved and a lot of it comes, you know, the work scope comes from our field investigation. <clears throat> so if there's any questions regarding the, the roof replacement and, and where we stand, <clears throat> I'd be happy to answer them. Excuse me, school board. This is LTV. I just need you to know that you have a caller waiting on the line. Uh, okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, we're not quite ready for questions yet at this point from the um, community, I don't think. Um, does anyone on the board have a um, question about the uh, roofing at this time? I'm just to go to level going this route and try to get this rectified now while the rest of the construction is going on. You know, it's really warranted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this first came up like what five or so years ago, and uh, it's like I. <laughs> but you know, things get done when they finally get done. This is definitely the time to to get it done. Yeah. Right. Um. All right. Well, the less glamorous part of this evening's presentation, certainly, and less fun, but very necessary, nevertheless. And uh, it's, I mean, it sounds like everything is in hand and, uh, you know, moving forward the way you're, you're expecting. So that that's good. <clears throat> what do you need from us, gentlemen? Anything? Um, at at this point, you know, just updating you on the work that we were doing, you know, wasn't going to hold us back from moving forward. I know you got to, uh, you were asking for the estimate so you can um, appropriate the money. But uh, at this point, you know, we're moving ahead with our design documents and that part of the administrative process will, will follow up. And then, you know, hopefully when we get ready for bidding, all the money will be in place. So that we go to award, you know, contractors will have, um, you know, initial pay recs and things that will need to be paid through that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for being with us this evening. We really appreciate your, um, your presentations. Uh, always a lot of information and it's always great to see the progress that you're making so uh, and that you take the time all to be here with us in the evening. So um, thank you very much. And, you're welcome. Uh, yep, you're welcome. It's our pleasure. We will uh, see you next month, I guess. Thank you guys very much. Okay. You're welcome, Tim. Thank you. Have a good night. Take care. Right. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Matt, we're not due for public commentary until um, uh, Deb, Deb's going to give us a COVID update, and then we'll be um, taking questions uh, for public commentary number one after that. Okay, I just need to interrupt one more time. The caller has just left the meeting, so until somebody else calls in, I'll let you know, but you can continue on anyway. Um, yes, well, I mean, they, they shouldn't really be calling in until it's time for uh, for, for public commentary. I, I is that clear on, on like on the TV? Well, all it's saying right now is what the phone number is to call in. Um, you you tell me when you want to take the callers. I just let you know that you have X amount of callers on the line. Oh, okay. So I would say, I, mean, I don't know that you need the phone number up there now, but when we say it's time for public commentary, number one, if you want to put it up and we'll wait, you know, a minute or so, so you don't have people calling in and waiting when we're not ready for questions. I think that might work better. Uh, it's, it's, okay? al it, it's already up there, so... Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving along with the agenda, um, uh, Deb uh, will have a uh, an update on uh, uh, the COVID report for us for, 
Uh, yes, the COVID report. In fact, right now, my colleagues are listening to our governor roll out the vaccination plan for the state of New York. So I keep seeing a little um, buzz on my phone of what that's going to look like coming um, down from uh, Albany. But currently on the school, uh, spring school report card for COVID, since September, we have had 20 students, including the one reported today, um, be diagnosed with COVID, including four students this week are in that 20. We have had two staff test positive over the break, which uh, joins two previous teachers that had tested positive. So out of a total of 782 staff and students, we have had only 24 cases at spring school. This is less than 0.05%. The county average for schools is currently 1.4%. So we continue at spring school to quarantine entire classes. Um, because those classes are cohorted, even though they're masked, even though windows are open, even though we're social distancing, those students are spending their entire day together in the same room. So when there is one student that um, test positive that was in that room, we are uh, quarantining the entire class. It's very hard for individuals to look back 48 hours and realize if they were within six feet of that person for more than 10 minutes, staff included. You know, they can guess that they worked with, especially a young child for more than 10 minutes um, close by, or depending on the seating chart of the child, we know that if the child's in the front of the room, that teacher is usually teaching from the front of the room. So that would put that teacher out as well. On Monday, um, July 4th at a press conference, our governor made a statement that kind of threw our schools in a little bit of a tizzy. He reported that um, any school can stay open if they test. We have been in contact with our county executive's office and at this time there is no testing mandate currently in place for Suffolk County. However, we are expecting new guidance. In the interim, the county has indicated that they would assist districts who wish to test. At this time, I think it would um, benefit the Springs community as a whole if Springs School would voluntarily test its staff and its children. We have surveyed our parents, we have surveyed our teachers, and we do meet the criteria. We do have more than 20% of the total population that would agree to um, be tested. We don't need a script. The Commissioner of Suffolk County Department of Health would be the uh, authorizing physician. We don't need to pay for vaccinations. The county would provide the vaccinations. We do have to enter an agreement with the Department of Health, an MOA, which is currently with our attorneys. Our nurses um, have been trained, uh, a clerical staff, have been um, reported to the electronic clinical laboratory reporting system as the person that would enter our um, results into a computer base. In lieu of doing our own testing, we can strongly um, participate in local testing. The problem that we're having is receiving that information back to us. So just for an example, this week alone, We've had over 30 um, children and staff tested, but we don't always find out the results of those testing. Um, and that's what goes into our report card. So if I could get 77 students and staff weekly to report that they went for a test and what the results were, we wouldn't have to do our own testing. But um, we don't always hear if someone gets tested, whether it be a child or whether a staff member. So I'm asking um, the board tonight just to consider there's no resolution needed, just your nod at that. Um, as soon as this MOA is available for our attorneys, we consider um, providing a day of testing at spring school for our staff and our students. Um, on the vaccination, yeah, just, yeah, go ahead. Just just to clarify, I think you used the word vaccination 
during oh, that sorry. time. It should have been just testing, yeah. right? Okay, yes. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I got vaccinations on my mind because that's the next topic. Um, I'm very happy to report that some of our staff last week were able to be vaccinated. They were in the A1 group for therapist, speech therapist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, even our psychologists were able to get vaccinated. A couple of uh, adaptive PE teachers, a special ed teacher or two, and a teacher assistant. We are permitting our staff um, school business hours. It's similar to my colleagues, um, especially on the East End, to leave work early, arrive late in order to get vaccinated. Today, before um, our executive session, I was able to speak to our school physician. She has applied and been approved to give out vaccinations. As soon as her doses are um, in her office, she will arrange with Spring School to do a Saturday vaccination day for all Spring staff at her office in East Hampton. It does require two doses. She is committed to providing both doses. Um, depending on which vaccination she gets, it's 21 or 28 days um, separation between the two vaccinations. I, I'm thrilled that our uh, local physician is um, on board and making this as easy as possible for our staff to get vaccinated. Uh, my colleagues are um, listening right now and some are going as far as Westchester and uh, Long Beach to get vaccinated this weekend. So we're, we're fortunate, we just have to sit tight and wait for when those doses arrive um, to our local physician's office. Questions? Did, did she give you any indication of when they would arrive in her office or just she didn't know? She's hoping within the next three weeks, no later than three weeks. Okay. okay. And there is, you know, a lot of paperwork that goes along with it. I told her that we would assist in any way we could. And I think uh, a Saturday is a, is a good idea. Parking over there will be, you know, she won't have any of her regular um, patients. It'll be just for vaccinations of uh, school staff. Quickly, would the Department of Health be able to start this testing program? As soon as I get the MOA in their hands um, and we get someone to go out to, I guess it's uh Sayville in that area to pick up the vaccinations. We were looking at a Wednesday. We we're hoping to do it oh, on a Wednesday. You testing. You keep on saying. You keep testing. on saying vac vaccinations. Testing. <laughs> testing. All right. We're not vaccinating at spring school. We're possibly no. Going. We're we're testing it. We're looking to test at spring school. We're looking to vaccinate at our local um, school physician's office. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm fine with that for, for having testing, going out to school, if that's going to help um, have a better understanding of our situation there. Yeah, me too. Everybody's good? Yeah. Um, and as I get more information uh, from our uh, local uh, physician, I will let uh, the board know as well as our teachers. I've been keeping them, all of our staff informed uh, as to uh, the rollout on vaccinations. Okay. Um, so Deb, I know we're still on track to have fifth through eighth, I believe, come back to school this Friday. Is it this Friday? No, uh, three to five. Oh, sorry, three to five. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Three to five this Friday and then February 8th, six through eight. Because that requires a whole new schedule, and we're um, making the class sizes um, smaller at the junior high level. And how's everything at school with the younger grades who are in there four days a week? With um, How's everybody doing? They're doing well. Christine um, will report out on some nice projects that they did over the, the break, um, before the break, on kindness and trying to do virtual field trips. They did one to the Guild Hall um, with uh, artist in residence, Barbara. So I'll let Christine tell you about some of the things. We're trying to keep things somewhat normal. Um, it's difficult. It's 
it's a challenge, but you know, our uh, music teachers sang for our students before we went out on Christmas break. They were outside. Um, they greeted the buses in the morning and then greeted Caroline in the afternoon. So everyone's trying really hard. Everybody's glad to see the children back in school um, as uh, much as they have been. And I have to say again, the children are resilient. They have learned to stay with mask on all day. They're very compliant and our, our staff as well. Um, on some of the practical matters that we were concerned about before, like having enough PPE and cleaning supplies and getting rooms cleaned and using the desk shields as everything, you know, do we have adequate supplies and are the shields and things working out well? Yes, I think we went with a little better shield and they, they stay put on the desk. They don't, you know, flop off. Cleaning has not been an issue. We haven't had any um, concerns from our teachers about the cleanliness of their rooms. Our custodians are doing an amazing job. Uh, they do have the um, steamer that they use during the day to do the frequent um, door handles, uh, spaces that children go to frequently, like our bathrooms are done uh, really well on Wednesdays with the heavy duty equipment that we have. So um, all, all in all, uh, we have more desks coming, more shields coming for the junior high. So we, we want to maintain the social distancing, windows open, mask wearing, um, and still be um, precautionary when we go to quarantine a uh, class. And our bus drivers are doing an amazing job too. Um, thank you very much. I know Christine will have some more uh, information for us later on in the meeting. Um, and right now we are due for um, public commentary number one. So this is the time for if anybody who is watching would like to call in with any questions on uh, generally any of our items of board business, which is uh, personnel and finance um, but also regarding any of the two topics that we just covered, our, our COVID report, or if you have a question on the, uh, the building presentation that happened, if anybody would like to call in about those matters at this time, please do so. There will be a second um, public commentary for any uh, additional topics at the end of this meeting. Um, but right now for the two presentations and our items of board business, um, if you have a question and would care to call in, you are free to do so. All right, you have zero callers right now. Okay, well, we'll just wait a minute. Uh, nope, I take that back. You now have one. Okay, great. So if on you want to put them through. I will unmute them on your signal. Okay, you can go ahead. Thanks. All right, Cola, you are live. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Could you um, state your name, please? Uh, hi, my name is Jessica Bull. Um, first, I want to thank you all for you know this thoughtful presentation. And I... can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. OK. And a huge thanks to all the teachers, staff, administrators for all that you're doing. Um, I am a little bit concerned about opening the schools um, four days a week for the third to fifth graders. And I was wondering whether it might not be more cautious to have some options for those who would prefer to attend remotely, at least until we get these test results back. Um, thanks for calling in with your question. Deb, do you want to answer that? Sure. Um, if the um, the caller wants to give our principal a call tomorrow and discuss her individual concerns, we will try to um, assist. But as I just mentioned, our numbers are very low at spring school, and we are um, really practicing everything that we've been taught uh, with very good results. So, but we do understand um, there are circumstances that um, we're willing to uh, try to accommodate those parents' needs. Great, thank you. Thanks for calling. Uh, 
And as of right now, that is all the callers. Okay, well, if we don't have anyone else calling at this point, um, uh, we can go ahead and move on to our personnel items. Um, sure. Sounds good. Can you hear me, Barbara? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Um, so I will go over this month's personnel items. Um, so item A, uh, Julie and I, our brains last month were still in 2020. So we are just correcting Kim Belkin's leave to January 16th of 2021, not 2020. Um, and so the rest of that is the same. B is a leave of absence for an employee um, extending their leave. C is a leave of absence for Victoria Hoffman for the purpose of child care. Um, D is the leave of absence for uh, an employee for medical. E is a transfer for Mike Strecker, um, who was our senior office assistant uh, for our principal and assistant principal. Um, he has asked to be transferred to Hampton Bay, so we wish him the best of luck. Um, that's going through civil service. And we are in the process of looking for a um, new senior office assistant. F is the appointment of Nicole Payne, office assistant. Uh, office assistant. Um, G is the appointment of Maria Pagliucci, part-time senior office assistant. So she will be filling in for Mike uh, part-time. Um, H is the appointment, we're very excited, of Jocelyn Westen um, for our registration, uh, Spanish speaking. So she helps our parents tremendously. And if you remember, um, Elizabeth uh, left in October, so, or right before Thanksgiving, sorry. So we're happy to have someone fill that seat. Um, I are update substitutes. So we do have um, some office assistant substitutes just to help us out with um, Mr. Strecker leaving, um, some non-certified substitutes. We do have two teachers that their certifications went through, substitutes that their certifications went through, Jasmine and Devin. So um, that's exciting to always have more certified teachers subbing for us. And we do have two new um, employees, substitute Sarah Havens and Brandon Kelly that will be joining us. Um, Jay is the appointment for early morning uh, teachers to help support our students. And um, that has started this week. And they're doing, ver or actually last week, I'm sorry, it's Monday. Um, and the kids are here at 7.15 and ready to go and working hard. So that's wonderful. Um, K are stipend positions as per the STA um, contract. If you remember in the beginning of the year, we said we would put on stipends as we see uh, fit through the time of COVID uh, rather than appointing everyone. Um, so Jacqueline Rambo, coordinator for the um, New York State Mentoring Program, and Frank Cole will be doing our eighth grade DVD um, montage for the graduating class at graduation. L is the Third Amendment to Ms. Janice's um, contract. Uh, M is the Second Amendment to Ms. Crozier's contract. N is the Third Amendment to Ms. Flaherty's contract. O is the First Amendment to Ms. Cornell's contract. P is the Third Amendment to Ms. Carmona's contract. Q is the Second Amendment to Ms. Bistrian's contract. Um, we have R, which is the MOA for the CSEA, which are our teaching assistants, their contract um, is finalized, as well as an MOA for our school nurses. Oops, sorry. And we, um, T is the revised appointments of special committees that 
you had uh, done at the reorg meeting, but we had some new people to add and some people to take off. So those are updated. And I think that is it. Are there any questions about personnel? Uh, not a question, but, you know, I just like to wish Mike well with whatever he's uh, moving on to. And also uh, to welcome Jocelyn uh, Boyston. I'm glad that we got somebody. I know at times it's taken us uh, quite a long time in the past to get someone in a Spanish bilingual person in there. So um, I'm very happy to see that. And uh, I don't have any other questions. Does the uh, anyone else on the board have a question? Okay. Uh, in that case, do I have a motion to move personnel items A through uh, T to consent agenda? Um, second. All in favor? Aye. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. You're welcome. And we have the we have a very short finance list. Deb, do you want to go over anything in particular on this? Um, no, they're pretty um, straightforward, Barbara. If anybody had any questions, uh, no. We have uh, internal audit uh, for November and December, and then the warrants. You know. You have uh, Eleanor Whitmore in there. You have the Milk Fund. Again, pretty straightforward. And, and uh, again, Mike is sorry that he couldn't be with us this evening. Uh, does anyone on the board have any questions about the finance items? Then do I have a motion to move finance items A through C to consent agenda? I'll make a motion. Second. Tim was seconding there. All in favor? Aye. And back to Carrie. Yep. So, um, CSC, we just had a few cases from um, our last meeting to now. Some amendments, uh, some kids moved in, some kids moved out. Um, and we will be starting annuals at the end of this month, starting with our high school, um, our eighth graders going into high school. And um, that starts at the end of January. So we're rolling right into uh, annuals and try to get um, the high school done for budget purposes, as you all know. Okay, thank you. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby accepts the recommendations from the Committee on Preschool Special Education and the Committee on Special Education, CPSC cases one to two and CSE cases one through seven. Do I have a motion? Make a motion. Second. Tim, your volume's off. Uh, Tim and Dave, you, you're both on mute. You want to unmute. So do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And uh, time for our principal's report. Christine? Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, so, um, just want to start by saying that our staff has not missed a beat. Um, even though these are difficult times and unusual circumstances, the teachers, the TAs, um, you name it, the custodians, the bus drivers, everybody has really pulled together and, and really are trying their best to give our kids the best educational program that they can possibly give. And I wanna say thank you to the board for funding uh, some of the support because without that, it wouldn't happen. Thank you for helping the teachers do what they do best, which is really love and teach our kids. So I'm just gonna go through a little bit of what, what they've been doing here. Um, and I have a bulleted list because there is so much. Um, as Deb mentioned, our character ed program is currently focusing on acts of kindness. So before the break, um, they, some of the classes were doing special projects. The fifth graders made holiday cards for residents at the Southampton Rehabilitation Center. Um, our third graders are collecting cans of soup called for the Super Bowl um, for the food pantry. And basically every grade is responsible for a different act of kindness that supports our community. Um, 
The third grade has also partnered with the retreat for a hands are not for hitting program. It is a program we've had in our school for many years. However, this was the first year we launched the virtual edition of it and the kids were very engaged. Um, it was a big success. So we were really grateful to the retreat for, for being flexible with us and pr uh, providing the workshops virtually. Uh, our science and tech departments have been busy making topographical maps and clay models of the Grand Canyon in our, in our um, junior high and fifth grade classes. Uh, the science classes in third grade and below are working on the physics of sound and they're collaborating with Ben Jones in our music department to see the marriage of science and music. So that's a pretty cool project. Um, our tech department for junior high is working with VEX Robotics, even though we're not able to have our after school robotics teams this year. The kids that are um, tech savvy and those who are learning to be are still working with robotics in tech class. And now they're doing a very special project where they're building a gaming PC. Um, I literally had to YouTube that to, to make sure I understood what, what it really was. And it is very a very complex project where they build a personal computer made for gaming from the ground up. And they're doing that with Mr. Cole and the kids are really excited about that project. They're also using a uh, model, a project that was done by David Polkowski, one of our alumnus uh, that's now currently in the high school. So they're using that project as a model. Uh, reading assessments are underway uh, to see where our K through eight students are at with their, um, their reading skills. Um, our literacy coordinators and some of our other teachers from other grade levels are trying out a new COVID-friendly, hands-free assessment program called Literably. Um, and some of the teachers were trained on that last week. So that's something new and interesting. And hopefully that will lead the way into digital portfolios at some point, which is something that we have, we've talked about for years here at Spring School. Um, some of our little guys are writing informational books. Um, whether it be on animals or a different, uh, a, a hobby, they're writing informational books. And our student council is partnering with our reading department and our PARP program, which will look a little bit different this year. Student council is creating a special guest reader library where uh, staff and students, older students, will read special selections, different books, whether it be nonfiction or fiction, and they will be video recorded and those videos will be available in our library uh, link so that anytime at home a child wants to hear a favorite story or see a favorite staff member or a favorite student council student member, uh, they can click on that link and, and get a nice story read to them. Um, we are also working with students uh, Guild Hall, our student art festival is coming up. It opens on January 16th in our art department. Um, Ms. Castro and Ms. Marino have been working very hard with both visiting artists and the curators of the student art festival. And you can view it either live or in um, virtually, and you have to make appointments to, to view it live. The, the, um, the focus this year is on past, present, and future. And I'm not gonna spoil the surprises because there's a lot of really neat projects that the kids have done that they have submitted for the Guild Hall Art Festival. So you'll have to just go and see it and, and see their projects. We also have donuts. Uh, yes, donuts. We have our fourth grade celebrating their social studies unit on Dutch colonization. So they have invited Dreesen's Donut Truck to come someday in January before the end of the month. Um, Dreesen's will be handing out individually packaged and COVID, you know, hands-free, COVID-friendly um, treats for the kids. And I just heard from our character ed coordinator, the fourth grade is gonna work with character ed and they would like to purchase a donut for every student K through eight to celebrate and bring a little, a little sweetness to a, the winter months. So those are some things that are coming up. Um, we also have PD happening. Literacy is, uh, we are working on a literacy vision statement with our literacy coordinators and literacy team. And we are aligning our units of study, K through eight. And we're also looking um, at ENL practices, 
um, Ms. Garcetti and her team, her ENL team are offering a professional circles that will happen after school hours and that will be for credit. And uh, they'll be focusing on different practices to, to move our ENL students forward, but also distance learning practices that are particular to benefiting ENLs. So that's a little bit of what we have going on. Like I said, our staff hasn't missed a beat and you know, I, I, I can't thank them enough. Oh, thank you very much for that update. I mean, that's a little bit of what's going on. I can't imagine what the rest of the lot's going on right now. I can't keep going. <laughs> and uh, it, everything sounds so engaging and interesting and how great that our kids are really being mindful of others. You know, they're getting a treat and including other people. I think, you know, our character education program is, you know, working really well. So I'm so happy to get that report from you. A lot of good stuff going on. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. We're, we, uh, we believe that kindness is contagious too. So that's our theme. Great. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, you're welcome. If you just want to fill us in on the enrollment report. Sure. We had um, a couple of students move in, a couple of students move out. Um, we are nine students from where we were last year. If we include our students that are being homeschooled um, by their parents. So we anticipate those students coming back in the fall. So our enrollment will, will be very similar to previous years. Um, our uh, Eighth grade is um, at 75 and no, 78 right now. And um, the class coming up next year will be smaller, 66. So, yeah. and our high school enrollment is definitely um, higher than what we anticipated. Um, we continue to check our uh, tuition bills closely and making sure that children are where they say they are. And um, Carrie uh, stays on top of that for us. Uh, otherwise, everything else is pretty status quo. Um, only about 27 uh, pre-K students at this time. I know we have registration open for next year coming up at the end of the month, and that will help us with our um, kindergarten numbers as well for next year as soon as we get our registrations in uh, probably about March. Deb, can I make a public announcement? Yes. <laughs> um, high school registration verification will also start eighth graders going into ninth grade in February and pre-K registration for 21, 22 is what you said will start as well in February. Um, and then kindergarten will be in March. So that is, they'll be detailed um, on our website as well as in the newspaper. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, moving on to old business. Deb, you're mentioning something about an extra, uh, I guess, Juneteenth and when school was starting, yes? Yes. Um, I do not um, want the board to vote on the calendar tonight. I just wanted to put the calendar out there. I am waiting to see what East Hampton and BOCES calendars look like, but I have contacted um, both BOCES and East Hampton to get an idea of what they were looking at. and. Everyone is going to be celebrating um, June 20th this year, it will be. It's a Monday, and it is the holiday where our um, the slaves were freed. Other states have had this holiday, but back in June of 2020, our governor, uh, by order um, 204, declared Juneth, a holiday for New York State. So we added that to the calendar, but we also were mindful of our construction and we would like to start school after Labor Day. 
the um, two Jewish holidays will still be off for students, but we would have superintendent's conference days on the 7th and 8th, still have our traditional day off before Thanksgiving on the 24th, and three um, total superintendent's conference day with November 2nd being the third one, still built in two snow days um, around Memorial Day weekend. We will get our 181 days in by contract for our employees and our school calendar um, will be in compliance as well with the um, superintendent's conference date counting towards their 180 days. Not much you can do on this calendar. <laughs> right, so just so just checking that in the next school year, Juneteenth will be on June 20th, which is a Monday, which will be a holiday. But this year, it looks like it's in our calendar. It's actually being celebrated on a Saturday. So there's not, we're not, uh, it's not a day off this school year, correct? Correct. Uh, this, um, Order from the governor came out June 17, 2020, and most school calendars were already set. Okay. So right. for this year, no. But for next year, I have checked with my colleagues, and they are all taking it. Um, they just haven't adopted their calendars yet, so we have time to adopt ours. Okay. And, I, and I'm pushing out to after Labor Day, even with staff coming in due to the construction. Right, okay. And having two snow days in there, I mean, we'll have a better idea once this winter's over, but now that, you know, since uh, remote is definitely a, a working option for that, maybe two snow days is only necessary. I feel like one year we had five in there or something. Recently. Yeah, well, it, it depends on how the calendar works out, it, you know. When you're able to start really early with Labor Day, you gain extra days. Um, there was one year that we took a couple of Fridays off, which was really nice. Right. I think that's the year you're talking about. We must have had five snow days built in, and we just spread them out, especially in the month of March. Hey, Deb. Yes. Think of, uh, snow days. Um, I know a lot of parents complained, you know, we didn't take the snow days when we had two, the two days of snow. Uh, yes. We didn't have, we had one day. But anyway. Can, can you explain to me what exactly what a snow day really means? It's not really just the snow, correct? It, it could be for anything that closes a school for a reason. So in other words, let, let's say on a Monday morning, I find that we have no heat in the building. Okay, and I have to shut the school and it wasn't anticipated. We're, we're required to be in school for 180 days. You can count the superintendent conference days in there. So you just can't close because you have no heat. You, you, you have to build in some contingency days for an emergency like that. They call them snow days, but it could be for a hurricane. It could be for having no heat. Right. Be for having COVID. I think we had to use snow days up there, right? Didn't we? That, that was at the beginning. Well, we, last year, you're right, Barbara. Last year, we um, alternated our, our spring break. And we taught throughout spring break. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think so, some parents were surprised that we didn't call a snow day. But when you only have two snow days built into your calendar, and you have an alternative yet, you sort of have to be careful about using them too soon. It, it was it was early. It was a rainy kind of snow day. It was not the best kind of snow day. No. So should we change it from snow day to contingency days? Um, I'm sure you can. I, I don't see why you can't. Because it's, I'm more, you know, I mean, I understand that you know, we got lucky we didn't get a lot of snow, but you must take a lot of consideration considering if it gets zero degrees out in February and those glass and winds are open, there's some real thinking you have to do about it, right? Right, but that's what's nice now about remote days. Right. 
is that, you know, you, you can take a remote day. You don't have to remember when you don't have enough of these contingent days. Yes, we have two built into the calendar, but then you can go into these other breaks. Usually you go into Easter break because February break is too early because you can get a snowstorm in March. So normally what you start to do is you peel off from your spring break and nobody likes to do that. There have been some school districts caught really in, in a difficult situation where um, staff have made arrangements to go away for spring break and they've had to cancel their plans because they had to come back to school early. So, you know, we tell everybody this, this is a calendar that we're setting forth, but, you know, if you get a hurricane, which I know the East End has gotten, and you have to close school for a week in October, you've lost your spring break. But now that we have remote learning, that may not be a, an issue in, in the future. But if you have a hurricane, lose your power, and nobody can has access to anything, then that's, you know, that's an issue for having those contingency days, that, but then, you know, can possibly eat into other time, so. Correct. So at this time, we're going to handle the minutes from the previous meetings, which we didn't do earlier in the meeting. Um, so uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the December 7th, 2020 and the December 21st, 2020 uh, meetings? Motion. Second. Second. Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any other new, bus new business or anything else that anyone would like to bring up at this time? Yeah, okay. So, uh, Matt, at this time, we have time for public commentary number two, where we will take uh, phone calls on uh, whatever somebody wants to come in about. It doesn't have to pertain to the agenda. If, uh, if anybody wants to call in now, please uh, feel free to do so. Okay, at this time we do have one phone call, so on your command, I'll go ahead and take that call. Great, please put the call through. Hey, it's Jessica again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I got nervous last time, <laughs> and I hung up quickly, but I, um, I'm so grateful that you're, you're willing to do something to accommodate my child, but this is more than just about my child. This is about the community as a whole and being worried about our teachers and our administrators and those parents who don't have a voice. And I, I have a couple of concerns. Like our seven-day average is 10%. Not, not all of the desks are six feet apart under the new plan is what my understanding is. And um, the numbers, the statistics that you're basing this decision on they are coming from the hybrid model, which was really effective. And I feel very strongly that the, the data that we're seeing across the state, particularly in Suffolk County, warrants having some caution here, waiting until we have a chance to let our teachers and our admins get vaccinated twice, waiting until we can roll out the excellent idea that, that you have set forth in, in having our student body tested. Right now, Yes, the report card, maybe it looks great. That is just an indication that what we've been doing so far has been working, and we shouldn't give up now. I understand, I completely understand and empathize with the plight of parents who need to have their children in school. I do, I get it, and I have empathy for you. But unless there's an opportunity for those who are not in that situation to join remotely, we are going to basically give up all the ground that you've so thoughtfully put in place right at the finish line by putting how many kids is it 750 kids are going to be in the school N not all at once jessica we're doing three to five for friday the 15th and some some kids are back four days a week out of that group and then the eighth, the seven and eighth leaders are not coming back till February eighth. So that's in less than a month from now. At that point, when we're still feeling the aftermath of this massive surge, what is the amount going to be February eighth? 
February 8th, we should have about 630 children in the building because we do have about 50 children that are homeschooled right now. And how what is the how far a part of those desks going to be in that scenario? The junior high, the reason why we're waiting for the junior high is we ha actually have to create new sections. So that's why they're not coming back. What is the spacing going to be in the, in the desk for the third to fifth graders on Friday? They are six feet apart with desk shields. Okay, that is actually not in keeping with what we're seeing, the latest that's come out on what the distance should be, because I watched it yesterday. They are saying outside six feet, inside 10 feet. I, I haven't seen that, Jessica. I'm sorry. We've been going by six foot. Which I All think along. I'm happy TV. to provide that. I just, I feel like there's such an eagerness, and I feel it too. My daughter's so happy when she's in school. She loves her teachers. It's such a joy, and there's this weight comes off of her in school. And as a parent, I want to see that. But at the end of the day, our physical safety is so important, and to give it up now, understandably, it is just so short-sighted. Jessica, thank you for calling in. I mean, you certainly have concerns that a lot of parents have. And uh, but I know that the administration, what the information, sorry, that we're hearing um, through the administration and from the CDC and from um, Suffolk County is that spread is really not happening in school and that there are, you know, issues with not having kids being in school. And it's not just parents who want their kids back in school. So many teachers, you know, they, they right. want to have kids in there with them because it's, you know, frustrating having to teach in this manner. It, you know, there's a lot of frustration from people and, and fear, but I think the school has planned out this, um, you know, bringing students back in at a slower pace. So far, it has been successful with the lower grades that we've had. It doesn't appear that we've had any significant spike due to the increased uh, number of children in the classes that we have. Um, and so, you know, all we can do is take steps and change course as things indicate that a change needs to be made, but not making steps out of concern of what might happen, is that also really the best way to do? So to me, it seems like can our- Can I ask one more question? Weren't, wasn't the original guidance that we were supposed to close when schools, when it got to 10% in the community, and we're at 10% and beyond, that there's nobody on the school board who agrees with the position of caution. And, you know, Deb had such a fantastic idea of being proactive and, and testing everybody. Why not wait until those test results come back? We are not seeing the full picture right now. I Many are asymptomatic. I, back in the spring, those were the guidelines for what, what uh, rates were. But at this time, Suffolk and Suffolk County has made the suggestion of schools staying open depending on uh, the testing within the school. Is that not correct, Deb? Yes. In, in fact, this is we're waiting they for care about the economy more than they care about lives. Um, um, I don't really think that you can say that. And I don't think this is really be an appropriate place to make that suggestion. Um, I think people care a lot about kids' education and the many different ways it takes. And um, uh, I think that uh, your other comment is sort of an assumption that's not helpful as we make our decision here. So I really do appreciate your calling in and uh, what, you know, your thoughts on the matter. I know that the uh, Deb and wow. the administration has been open to parents who have these concerns calling in and it's something that the board and the school administration is reviewing on an ongoing basis. And as Deb, Deb um, could, if you could please refresh people as to what Suffolk County was suggesting regarding community rates versus school transmission. Correct. Um, they were saying that even though the positivity rate in Suffolk County right now is 9%, that schools can stay open because the school rate is at 1.4%. That is statewide. And if schools continue to test, even if it's not their own testing, but just get our parents and our staff to report back their results, we could be showing that that percentage of school spread is minimal. Can I so, ask one more question? At what point would that percent be too much? Like, 
you're saying, you know, the school is at, you know, 1.6%. Once you get, start getting those test results back, at what point would you revert to hybrid? I think that's a, that's a hard question. You have to see where the spread is. When I fill out the report, here's, here's a good indication. I have yet to check the box, yes, that there were two or more cases in the same classroom. There is an actual box for me to check that. I've been doing this report since September and I have yet to check that box. Now some schools are not quarantining entire classes. They are quarantining kids in a certain circle in the room or if they're in the front row, the people in front of them. We continue to quarantine the whole class because our kids are together all day long in that room. Our elementary teachers get quarantined because they're in that room all day with those children. And they work closely many times with them. Even if they're masked, they're still within six foot distance. At our junior high level, those kids are more responsible. Our teachers are not sitting next to them and helping them. <coughs> So we have not quarantined our teachers because they push into the classrooms for a period at a time. So we, we are being as proactive as we can and our nurses are being very attentive and our parents are really following the rules. They really are. We, we've had a number of um, students that were away that have not come back yet because they weren't able to get tested wherever they went away to. And we told them, you needed two tests, a test before you left wherever you were and a test when you got back here. And we're keeping them out the full 10 days if they have not been um, following the rules, the two tests. And anytime a child doesn't feel well, we send them home. Our staff knows they don't feel well, stay home. That's the best thing that we can do for each other is to, to respect each other and not come to school not feeling well. And, and, and we're, we're trying very hard to I just think the reality is when people need to work and they need to send their kids to school, they're going to send their kids to school sick. And, and I've had conversations with some of you offline where you have actually said that you've done that yourself when you were, you know, a parent of a young child. So it's happening. I think we have to really keep our eyes open and look out for each other. And if that means being cautious and waiting a little bit longer to see how these numbers come out, I think that would be more prudent. But I'm, I'm clearly overruled. I'm, I'm going to hang up now. But a uh, huge thanks to, you know, to listening to me and um, especially to all the teachers who um, are putting, putting themselves at risk to be such great forces um, for our children. Jessica, thank you. And give us a call tomorrow. We'll talk, OK? Uh, Deb, um, it, it gets back to, too, a little bit what we were talking about earlier with, you know, that testing program that the Department of Health is offering, I think, especially with um, some, you know, more students coming into the school sooner we can get that program up and running with the volunteer staff and the volunteer parents who are allowing their kids to be tested, I think the better, because then we can kind of monitor that, monitor that uh, as we go. Absolutely, Dave. That's why I think it's important. And as soon as I get that MOA back from our attorneys, I will be requesting our um, test and um, We'll do it on a Wednesday where parents can bring the children in to get tested. And we have our um, staff volunteers as well. I just took a quick um, uh, uh, detour over to the um, American Academy of Pediatrics website and right on their first page, updated school guidance, the AAP continues to strongly advocate that all policy considerations for school COVID-19 plans should start with the goal of having students physically present in school. So I, I know that idea has been out from them for a long time and that um, I think if parents do have concerns um, of bringing their children in, you might want to check in with your, your pediatrician and see what their thoughts are uh, in, you know, with whoever that is in, in the area and uh, what, what their thought is. And we have a number of remote teachers now too, Barbara, so we are able to accommodate a number of parent requests. 
Thanks, Deb. Uh, Matt, are there any other calls at this point? Uh, you have zero callers, Barbara. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else on the board have anything to discuss at this point? No, I think but though what Deb just mentioned about having some remote staff available, I think, you know, we could maybe find some solutions to s some uh, parents that might have some issues. There were a number of uh, parents who kept their children home following the Christmas break. Our, our attendance on the elementary level were, was uh, very high. And some parents kept their children home. Others, as I said, went away. Um, and we're accommodating parents as um, we know the information that they share with us. Okay, thanks very much, Deb. Um, at this time, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. Second? No second. All in favor? Uh, aye. Aye. Uh, we will see everyone back here on, um, oop, that's March. No, where do we go? February. Uh, February 8th will be our next meeting. We have a regular board meeting. We do not have a work session in between now and then. So, I think we do, Barbara. I look forward to seeing you all then. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Well, everybody. Bye.